All right, welcome everybody. We have a uh, terrific panel today, bioscience discoveries that will blow your mind. And I think at this conference we have heard a lot of um, important information, our brains have been stimulated, but there's been a fair amount of, um, let's say, information that can depress you. So we had up here a plenary with Noriel Rubini talking about you know, the state of the world economy. We heard Al Gore here yesterday talking about you know, the incredible positive things that we can do to save the planet, but the peril if we don't. I, I think what you're gonna find today in our discussion is a real sense of optimism about the future uh, that is embodied by the science and the research that is being done by the individuals represented here and their teams, but also uh, I think it will give you a real sense of uh, promise for the future. So we have a stellar lineup of panelists. What we're going to do is hear from each of them uh, and they'll give you a little bit of a flavor of what they're excited about, what they're working on. And then uh, we will have some time for discussion about uh, all things, you know, sort of innovation and discovery. So if you can turn to slide number one. Slide number one uh, is basically the, the bioscience that blows my mind. So this is my magic wand on the left. Uh, I got this at Harry Potter World. And on the right is Hermione Granger. And I have been studying Hermione and how she uses her magic wand. I've read all of the books about her, but I just can't quite figure out how to make it work to do magic things in science policy. But what you're gonna hear from in terms of our first speaker, Jack and Draca, is how he has absorbed information that is freely available out there on the internet and other places uh, to really you know, try to put that together into one place. So Jack, you are a student inventor, a scientist, you're now a cancer researcher, you're the 2012 Intel Science Fair grand prize winner. Um, you, you have been to probably more places than you know, many 16-year-olds around the world. Talk to us a little bit about the work that you're doing. Let me show a couple of photos. So slide number 13, if you can put that up. That is a picture, I believe, when you were winning your, um, your award. And <laughs> you can see why I'm having Jacko first, because he's really going to set the tone for our other panelists. If you can put up slide number 14, these are you know, examples of other times that you're, you're winning awards. Um, how about slide number 18? So you recently had the opportunity to visit Washington, D.C. You live in Baltimore, which isn't that far, but uh, you got a chance to go to a pretty special place, which is uh, the Oval Office and Pennsylvania Avenue. Talk to us about this journey and, and how, how you got to where you're sitting right now. Yeah, so essentially what I created was a new way to detect pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer that costs three cents and it takes five minutes to run. And it's 100% accurate, but also it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. Now you might be wondering why on earth is a 16-year-old really interested in pancreatic cancer? I mean, it's one of those obscure cancers. And I actually became interested because a close family friend passed from the disease when I was 13 years old. And then what I found is that 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And we really have no current standard of, diagno uh, standard of diagnostics. Our current standard is an $800 per test technique that also misses 30% of all cancers and hasn't been updated in over six decades. So then I decided to go and strive towards revolutionizing pancreatic cancer diagnostics with my armory of knowledge from ninth grade biology. <laughs> and so I went to a 13-year-old's best friends for knowledge, Google and Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test. And essentially what happened is I looked up what, are, what these different proteins are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And I stumbled across this um, database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have pancreatic cancer. So I just started plugging and chugging through this, and on the 4,000th try, I finally found a protein called mesothelin that just might work. And mesothelin is just your ordinary round-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is that it's found in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So then I had found a really reliable biomarker for pancreatic cancer, I shifted my focus to actually detecting that. 
And my breakthrough came in the most unlikely of places, high school biology class, in my opinion, the absolute stifler of innovation. <laughs> And I had snuck in this article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes. And that sounds like a big, complicated name, but they're really simple. They're just these long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 150,000 dead diameter of your hair. Yet, despite their small size, they have these incredible properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And we're learning about antibodies, essentially molecules that only react with one protein, in this case, a cancer biomarker. And what I thought is, if I weave these uh, antibodies into this network of carbon nanotubes, then you would have a network that would only react with one protein. But also, due to the properties of carbon nanotubes, you would have a network that would only change its properties, when, uh, its electrical properties, in the presence of that protein, and thus detect pancreatic cancer. And it's actually very simple to produce. It's kind of like making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. <laughs> you start with some water. You pour in the carbon nanotubes, pour in the antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. However, <laughs> I all of a sudden realized I needed a lab. My mom had put up with quite a lot. Like I got to culture E. coli on my like, kitchen countertop where I make sandwiches. She wasn't quite happy about that. But cancer research, that, was pretty, that, was, that wasn't going to happen in my house. So what happened is I emailed 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health that had anything to do with pancreatic cancer. I emailed them a budget, a timeline, a procedure, and materials list. And then I sat back waiting for positive emails to pour in. And then reality took hold. I got 199 rejections. Yeah. And some professors, I realized, weren't really as nice as their profile picture on the site looked like. <laughs> They kind of ripped apart my entire procedure line by line, saying why each and every step was wrong. However, one professor said maybe, and I went into his lab, and it turned out to be an interrogation. I sat down, and instantly he starts firing these questions at me, calling in more and more PhDs, and then there are like 20 PhDs plus me and the professor crammed into this tiny office room. But I got through it, I guessed on a lot of those questions, and I got them all right. I guessed C, like I do on the SATs. <laughs> And then what happened is I worked in the lab and I realized my procedure was nearly as brilliant as I thought it had been. But seven months later, I ended up with one small paper sensor that could detect pancreatic ovarian and lung cancer with 100% accuracy so far in clinical uh, trials. I know 100% is kind of taboo in science at times. But um, it's actually 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current standard of diagnostics. But also by simply shifting out that antibody in the sensor, you can pretty much detect any disease, ranging from HIV, AIDS, to Alzheimer's, heart disease, even other forms of cancer. So that's my story. All right. <laughs> So Jack, had your, you, you talked about how your mom didn't want you to do cancer research in her kitchen, but they clearly played a significant role in fostering this you know, kind of innate curiosity that both you and your brother have, because your brother is a little bit older and he is equally uh, inquisitive about the world. You know, what, what, what was it like for you growing up with, with your folks? I mean, what were they doing? I'm sure many parents out there would like to know um, how they can foster this same you know, sort of passion and zeal that you have. Well, um, I actually became interested in science when I was three years old. It actually had a bit to do with my other hobby, kayaking. So my parents got me and my brother, we were three and five at the time, this big plastic model of a river. And we would just like chug a brick in there and then test out how the bar flow changed at the uh, fate of an unfortunate piece of styrofoam. And um, then what happened is I started getting more and more into science. and. My parents, I thought they were jerks when I was younger. Like, they wouldn't answer any of my questions, but they would always ask me questions. I was like, why were you asking me these questions? But it worked, I suppose. And eventually, I, they kind of just like introduced little things. And believe me, we went through like all the musical instruments, all the sports, everything. I learned how to play the trombone quite atrociously. And then I finally landed on science and then in sixth grade, I did my first science fair project, and I loved it, so. Okay, so we're going to come back to this uh, topic a little bit. Next, we're going to hear from Tejal Desai. You're a professor of bioengineering and therapeutic science at UCSF. 
let's pull up a slide that shows some of the work that you do in terms of science education, slide 17. So if you have children, I would encourage you, there's a variety of places you can listen to talks by all of our speakers you know, on, on YouTube, but uh, Tejal, you've done a lot around science education, uh, certainly STEM education for girls. Tell us a little bit about the specific research that you're working on. My understanding is that you're trying to find novel um, ways to administer drugs that don't involve the current methodologies. And being someone who takes allergy shots um, at times three times a week, I'm really excited for your research and I hope it accelerates. Great. Um, so I probably didn't learn all of my science in ninth grade biology, but uh, uh, I am an engineer by training, and one of the things that really got me excited about um, being able to make an impact was bringing engineering into the biological world. And so here I am at UCSF um, after a sort of long path of going to different engineering institutions, um, realizing that the only way that I could make a lot of my engineering um, discoveries actually translate into patients was to sit being um, surrounded by both the, the clinical population as well as the basic scientists. And one of the things that I've really focused on is how do we get medicines um, to the right place in the body at the right time in the right dosage and make it in a way that's more affordable um, with greater efficacy and safety. And um, where I sort of bring my engineering is this whole role of nanotechnology, which is, as we've sort of probably all heard, you know, creating very tiny things. But um, we sort of exploit the properties of the nanoscale world, so creating materials that have very specified properties and are able to marry those with um, drugs of interest in order to um, get those drugs to the right place in the body um, target them, but even sort of at a higher level, um, make sure that the drug is actually delivered at the right dose. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that we got really excited about working on when I joined UCSF was the fact that if you look at how blindness is being treated, uh, for example, um, somebody who has macular degeneration, um, they are given a drug um, usually an anti-VEGF therapeutic, um, which is injected into their eye every month. So a long needle, essentially a syringe, is poked into the eye of um, patients that are um, generally ranging in age from 60 onwards. And it's a course of action or treatment that has to uh, be given pretty much the rest of the, the life of the patient. So you're going in every month having injections um, of this drug, which you end up giving over 100 times what you need just to get a tiny bit of drug to the right place. And so we've sort of developed a, a way where um, we create a very small film. Um, this is um, smaller or sort of thinner than a contact lens. And it's injected much in the same clinical standard of care, but instead of going in every month, this film um, releases drug right at the retina over six months to 12 months. So now you have an ability for a patient to take that same standard of care, um, instead of going in multiple times, actually be able to deliver a, a more effective dose um, over a longer period of time. And we've sort of taken that vision and, and uh, brought that to a lot of different parts of the body, um, looking at ways that we deliver oral medications. Um, we all swallow a pill, uh, but less than 0.01% of the drug that we actually swallow actually gets into our body. So again, how do we get the drug that we want to actually reach the target organs? And um, we use, again, nanotechnology. We use a lot of, uh, of our ability to engineer the surface of new materials. And um, we've recently discovered a way that you can open up tight junctions. Um, these are the junctions between cells that really prevent drugs from getting through and actually open them up transiently to get a protein across and then close it up. And we think this, again, will have a, a profound effect on being able to deliver drugs um, in ways that are non-invasive. So um, overcoming the needle injections that are used for insulin, for used for other large proteins, and really being able to think about marrying these technologies with um, what you'll hear about a lot in the future, which is sort of precision medicine, um, developing the right molecules and the right drug, but 
to us, that's not just enough uh, to do that, but really getting it then to the right place at the right time. So Tejal, I read a few things or saw a few interviews that you did about your childhood and interest in science. Uh, apparently, you know, we're in this panel about blowing your mind. You like to <laughs> blow things up, I understand. You know, I was a very, uh, at the curious child. As, <laughs> um, of course, you know, growing up, I don't think it was necessarily acceptable for, um, you know, a, a young girl to be interested in, you know, building and blowing up things in chemistry. And, you know, I was really fortunate to have a physics teacher who was um, actually a, a geologist turned physicist who said, you know, we're not going to have science in the classroom, we're actually going to take you outside. And uh, for a year, I had AP physics sort of out in the uh, real world, if you will. Um, and that totally changed my outlook on sort of what we could do with science. So I, th I think it really does start early on. Uh, and that's why I'm so passionate about bringing that um, to, you know, even the, the elementary school level. And the, the issue of STEM education in particular for girls, do you think that we are uh, sort of training girls to think that they shouldn't be doing that or can't do it or, you know, we're not, we're not thinking about all the possibilities of how do you bring all this together for girls? You know, I, I don't think it's a, that we're training them not to. I think we're just not making it exciting enough or sort of conveying the excitement, at less, especially at the, the younger ages. So if you look at, I mean, if you look at the statistics and you look at how many um, you know, boys versus girls are going into science, it actually is relatively the same until you get to the higher levels. And so there's something, um, you know, that happens where uh, women feel like they have to make trade-offs and choices. And I am really a firm believer that science can enable so many other things in your life um, and that it's not a trade-off to do science in terms of your uh, other goals in life. Great. So our next panelist is Dr. David Baltimore. David, you received your Nobel Laureate in Medicine in 1975. You're a professor of biology at uh, California Institute of Technology, and you're also president emeritus. And I was telling you that I had watched uh, some videos that were um, you know, sort of talking about your career. One of the things that a lot of your friends and colleagues said is that you have a very keen sense of what is about to be exciting in biology before others seem to be there. Tell us about what you are working on today and what you're excited about uh, and, and help us to understand how that could change the world. Well, I started off with only an interest in basic science. I wanted to know how the biological world worked. And I think I've often been in a position where I had the opportunity to work on things that opened up new vistas for for myself and for other people, uh, the major discovery I made was of an enzyme called the reverse transcriptase, which is a way of capturing genes. Um, and so I've been thinking about what you can do with genes for a very long time. And when I stepped down as president of Caltech, which is now some number of years ago, uh, I said to myself, maybe I'll do something different. I'll try to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, there's a biography of me called that. Um, but I will do it in a translational mode, in trying to take what's going on in the laboratory, things we do routinely, and try to make them into medicine. There's, there's a sort of unity to what we're all saying here, which is, that there are great advances that have been made in the laboratory over the last decades that have not been translated into clinical medicine and should be. And so I can entitle what I've been thinking is that gene therapy has come of age. And gene therapy is a way of using genes to do medicine. So genes are, as we all know, the basis of all of life. And we have viruses, that viruses I've worked with for years, that can actually take genes into cells, can change the genetic constitution of the cells of our body. And so we want to then use these genes to treat 
particular diseases. And the diseases that we've focused on are different than the standard genes you think of when you think about gene therapy. Because gene therapy has meant to a lot of people replacing genes that are defective, that we inherit. We inherit, all of us inherit defective genes. Uh, but for some, it's really uh, life-threatening. <clears throat> and so giving that gene back should be able to cure these inherited diseases, and in fact can. And today, in very selected areas, mostly very rare genes, this is being done. The first gene therapy was approved in Europe over the last year, and there are many others that are being used experimentally, I must say mostly in Europe. But I had the feeling that there were lots of other uses for genes. And in particular, uh, I was struck by the limits of the immune system. So we all have a very powerful, very effective immune system that fights off bacteria we don't even know are trying to invade us and viruses that we may not know we've suffered from. And they also, we know very well our immune system when we get a viral disease and then we get better from it. Common cold, chicken soup, go to bed, wait a few days and you'll be better, and you are. And that's all because the immune system is in there recognizing that there's a foreign pathogen in your body, fighting that pathogen off, and giving you lifelong protection against that pathogen. So that's the good side of the immune system. The bad side of the immune system is that there are some things it can't handle. And in particular, I've been interested in cancer, uh, a disease that I don't have to underline as important, and we heard a little about it. Uh, it's a failure of the immune system to not be able to handle cancer. Because cancer involves altered proteins. It's just the kind of thing the immune system should see, uh, and yet it doesn't. And the other thing that has struck me now for uh, decades is HIV. HIV is one of the scourges of the world. Uh, 35 million people are living with HIV infection today around the world. Uh, we have ways of controlling it, particularly in the, in the developed world, uh, but we really should be able to stop it. It's a, caused by a virus, small virus. Most other viral diseases, we can stop in, their tra in its tracks. We've eliminated smallpox from the earth with a vaccine. We've almost eliminated polio from the earth with a vaccine. We have vaccines that protect us against mumps, measles, chickenpox, you name it. HIV is another virus. Why can't we deal with HIV? Well, the answer is HIV is one step ahead of us. So the story is the same for cancer and for HIV. One step ahead of us knows how to vary its constitution to avoid the immune system and is also built in ways that the immune system is just not prepared to attack. So can we wed these two ideas, genes for therapy and the need for the immune system to be able to do better in very select areas? Yes, we can. And so we've been doing that now for uh, basically a decade, and have four programs. And I'll, I'll tell you very quickly about them. And I've written them down so I don't forget something. One is genes for antibodies. Uh, these can protect against HIV because the community of HIV research people have found fabulous antibodies that prevent the, to prevent the spread of HIV. Problem is delivery of those antibodies. And so we can use viruses to deliver the genes for antibodies. We deliver them at the moment to mice, to, the muscle, to muscle cells, make huge amounts of antibody. And we are now working with the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health uh, to test that in human beings. The second is to protect the cells that HIV infects against that infection. And there's a surface protein on those cells that is absolutely necessary for infection, so we're knocking out that surface protein using uh, a trick called small interfering RNAs. I won't go into it. 
That's being done in a small startup company in, in Los Angeles called Calamute. Then there are genes that can be used to present antigens to the immune system. And you can get much more effective vaccinations in that manner. So there's a company we've developed called Immune Design that's in Seattle that's working on that. And finally, we want to program the immune system to fight cancer. We're using genes to uh, direct killer T cells to kill cancer. Uh, and that's being done in a collaboration with UCLA because Caltech doesn't have a medical school or a hospital. Uh, and that has worked very well. In that case, we're actually treating patients today. And I want to end by just saying that all of this is based on an NIH-funded program that I've had in my laboratory for many years and that without the support of the National Institutes of Health at MIT, where I was originally, at Caltech, where I am today, uh, none of this would have been possible. Thank you, David. So I want to turn now to Dr. Francis Collins, who is the director of the National Institutes of Health. If you could turn to slide number two. This slide will uh, show you on the right how Dr. Francis Collins sometimes gets to work, of course, wearing his helmet for safety. Uh, on the left, I recently took my daughter, who is a little speck in that picture, to take your child to someone else's work uh, day to try to get her interested in science. And since I work in an office, I didn't think she could get the same uh, interest. So I took a picture of her there because I wanted to show Francis there are others waiting to take over his job. And, okay. and on days that he's tired, he can think about the future and, and Jack sitting next to him. Um, you know, Francis, you lead the entire enterprise at the NIH, and you've spent your entire career, you've, you've been called a gene hunter. If you turn to uh, slide number five, this slide shows you um, one of your um, friends that has progeria that uh, you recently gave a TED talk and you, you spoke about the impact of finding the gene and then trying to find the treatment. And then just uh, last but not least, if you turn to slide number eight, I was recently out at NIH for the day and, and parked myself in the NIH Clinical Center, which is really a crown jewel of uh, opportunity in clinical research and uh, had occasion to meet this woman who was taking care of her husband, who was there for his third clinical trial for geoblastoma. Uh, he was a little bit worse for wear. Uh, she had her t-shirt on about uh, brain cancer. And you know, it, I think it just punctuates the point of the investment of the NIH, as, as David was just speaking about, as you know, many sitting here have benefited from. Tell us, Francis, a little bit about what you're excited about today at the NIH and, and beyond. Well, it's a privilege to be on this panel with such distinguished presenters. I'm particularly glad to have Jack as part of uh, our conversation, sort of pointing us towards the future. I have this amazing privilege of leading the National Institutes of Health, and almost every day there is something that's bubbling up out of this remarkable biomedical community uh, in terms of new revelations about how life works and how disease occurs. And I thought I would just give you two themes in the quick space here. Uh, where things are particularly exciting right now, but they're somewhat arbitrarily chosen because I could have picked others as well. It is such a rich environment. There's never been a time uh, that matches this in terms of the rate of progress. If you could bring up first slide 27, I'm going to talk maybe unsurprisingly about genomics because it has been truly amazing to see the way in which our ability to be able to look at DNA sequence and apply that to a wide variety of applications has really transformed our understanding. 27, please. That would not be 27, I hope, unless we've got a different numbering system on my pages than yours. <laughs> 20. You can map and sequence the human genome, but uh, yeah, slides so. are, <laughs> are one thing that we like to challenge you with. <laughs> <laughs> if you can see it, it's the one that has Watson and Crick's original publication from 1953, because I wanted to make the point that we are at a seminal moment here. It's 60 years this month since Watson and Crick published that paper in Nature describing the double helical structure. And it was exactly to the month, 50 years after that, that all the goals of the Human Genome Project were completed, uh, giving us for the first time the chance to look at that information. Um, are we having any luck or shall I just keep on going? I think you should keep on going. If keep I could get going. a faster cares person to head on into the back and do it's, some assisting. They thought it was 27. Anyway, so what's happened since then? That first human genome cost us roughly $400 million, if you add up all the inputs that went into that, 
to get that first reference sequence. Over the course of the last 10 years, that cost has come down at a truly dramatic pace so that now your genome or mine could be sequenced for a little bit less than $7,000, and that curve is continuing to fall. And we used to sequence DNA using things that were as big as a phone booths. I'm actually holding in my hand now a DNA sequencing instrument, this one made by Ian Torrent, about the size of a postage stamp, and this can sequence a complete genome in about three days, uh, again, at this remarkably low cost. Well, that's opened up a whole vista of opportunities in terms of how to apply this. We have gone from only knowing the molecular basis of a few dozen diseases in great detail to the point where now we know that for about 7,000 diseases, which is amazing to be able to say. That's the good news. The unfortunate part of this is we only have treatments for about 250 of those, so that's truly going to vex us and challenge us in terms of what we need to do next, and I'm totally with David Baltimore in the opportunity and the responsibility now uh, to look at the translational steps that we need to speed up in order to make those basic science discoveries come forward as therapeutics as quickly as possible. One area where all of this DNA sequencing capacity has really opened up our understanding of disease is cancer. David talked about the immune approach to cancer. We're also learning what makes a good cell go bad, causing it to grow when it's not supposed to. Well, it's mutations in DNA. And we knew that for quite a long time, but we now have the ability systematically to look at a cancer cell and see what's wrong. If there's any chance the slides are back up and you could go to 32, that would be fun to show. So the Cancer Genome Atlas actually is an effort NIH has had underway for a couple of years. We are in the process now of completing the sequence of something like 20,000 tumors. That's like 20,000 human genome projects. Actually, it's 40,000 because not only do you sequence the DNA of the tumor, you also sequence the DNA from that person's blood so you can see what the differences are, and that tells you what's happened in the cancer that's caused those cells to grow when they're not supposed to. And that has shown a bright light in areas that we are actually quite excited about in terms of identifying new ideas about drug development because it points to new targets. And out of this is coming an increasingly long list of targeted therapeutics, not the one-size-fits-all chemotherapy, which has been the mainstay of, of cancer treatment, but drugs that actually go right to the heart of the problem. Of course, you need in this situation to be able to actually match the drugs that you choose with that particular individual's mutations in their cancer, hence the consequence we call precision medicine, which is where this is all going. I see on my screen we have arrived at slide something or other. Can you go forward? <laughs> Keep going, keep going, keep going, thank you, keep going, uh, keep going, and again, and again, one more, and now can you project that one? These targeted therapies don't always work like this, but this is a very a nice example, sort of a, a, an experiment to tell you that we're on the right track. This is a particular individual who, if you could see there in the left side of those x-rays in July 2009, had multiple deposits of lung cancer in both lungs. Stage 4 cancer, this is the sort of thing that generally is not compatible with survival for more than a few months, uh, had failed all of the standard chemotherapy, but then was put on a clinical trial with a drug called crizotinib, which turns out to target a specific kinase which is rearranged in her tumor, something called ALK. Most lung cancers don't have that rearrangement, but if your lung cancer happens to have that, the drug response is really remarkable. And you can see here between July and November, uh, those tumors have essentially disappeared. By the way, a follow-up on her, she is now four years out from this, uh, was completely in remission for three years, has now started to relapse, but there's a next generation of this same kind of kinase inhibitor, which she is now on and which seems just to be also giving her a good response. So here's the wave of the future that we all are looking for. Second theme, very quickly, and it has some very pretty visuals, so I hope they're up there. Go to the next slide. I want to talk to you about brain and the advances that we are able to achieve now in understanding how the brain works. Here are some examples. In the upper left, you can see a very beautiful multicolored picture where people have engineered a particular set of genes to allow neurons to turn different colors, and each neuron gets a different version of this, which means you can track where the connections to that brain cell are instead of getting all lost in the tangles. Brainbow, as it's called. Isn't that cute? 
uh, in the upper right where you saw that rotating uh, is a particularly uh, beautiful new way of looking in a living patient at the wiring diagram of the brain, something we call the connectome. And you can see, using a kind of a diffusion MRI, how one can identify those connections. And now there is publicly available data in just the last month or so on about 70 individuals to see what the similarities and differences are, including some identical twins. Kind of fun to go and see if you can pick them out. Actually, you can't, which is interesting. And then at the bottom, just published about a month ago, Carl Dyseroth at Stanford has come up with a way, if you want to look at the three-dimensional structure of the brain, to actually make a brain tissue transparent, which has been a big problem before. You couldn't see through it. So by using a variety of reagents, he's able to take, as you can see there, a mouse brain and make it so you can see right through it. But you've still preserved all of the anatomic structure down to the microscopic level, and you can still see what's there. So if you go to the next slide, this will show you uh, what you can see. Click again to get the uh, image started. This is a mouse hippocampus stained with a whole bunch of different antibodies to show you different kinds of cells. And that's just sort of slicing through it from front to back. But now imagine that you could do this in three dimensions. We're coming back out again, and now we're going to start to rotate this. And tell me that this doesn't give you a sense of wow, because it sure does for me. We've never had the ability to do that before. Each one of those dots is an individual neuron. The structures and the way they're connected to each other, which has been outside of our reach, is now visible and apparent. Next slide. So other things that people are doing here that are really dramatic and which connect the ways in which we're learning about the brain with real human applications uh, include the ability now to build these brain-computer interfaces, as published in this paper by one of our grantees, John Donahue. Uh, this woman is a quadriplegic for the last 18 years. She can't move anything below her neck. And you may notice she has something implanted on the top of her head, which is actually a little electrode, which is then placed into the motor cortex. So by thinking, she can train herself to move this robotic arm. Next slide shows you her doing this. This is always, this is only by her thoughts, picking up this water bottle, thinking about it, rotating it, She's never done that before. This was capturing the first time that she was able to achieve this. And there's a very happy smile from the researcher, too, you might notice. <laughs> uh, so all of this has led us, next slide, uh, to an opportunity uh, to actually build on some of those technologies and bring together uh, disciplines like nanotechnology, uh, like all kinds of different neuroscience, engineering, robotics, computer science, and medicine into a new initiative announced by the president just a month ago the Brain Initiative, which has many interesting components, which is intending to basically accelerate the process of our being able to understand how circuits in the brain actually work and how we might be able to use that information for diseases like epilepsy, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, schizophrenia, autism, and so on. All of this is going to be a long-term effort. Don't get me wrong here. This is a 10 or 15-year project to try to really have a serious opportunity to understand how circuits in the brain work but we're on the way. And one of the things we hope to do is to get the scientific community completely engaged and the public to help us be sure we're taking full advantage of this. Finally, one member of the public has already gotten interested. If you look at the next slide, you'll see who I mean. Uh, we all got to get on board here. And so uh, Stephen, in this uh, rather silly rendition, which you can still see up on the web, uh, wore the skull cap with electrodes that I brought along with me to New York. And yes, we were able to show that Stephen Colbert does have brain activity, despite what you might have heard otherwise. And Thank you. <laughs> so, Francis, I think you've been on the Stephen Colbert show how many times? Four times. And uh, each time he kind of throws new things at you. You, oh, you told me that you, he wasn't acknowledging that he would put that on, you know, up to minutes before, so. No, he does not want to have anything planned. There is no script. <laughs> there is no rehearsal. Uh, he walks in and he says, okay, I'm going to get you. You're going to go down. Let's I, start. I, I, I encourage you all to take a look at it. I, I remember the funniest thing to me was he said, can you see that part of my brain that has Call Me Maybe? And can you erase that, please? <laughs> <laughs> that, that song, no offense to Carly Rae Jepsen. Okay, <laughs> last but not least, uh, Idawan, I would love it if you could talk a little bit about the work that you are doing. You are an associate professor of electrical engineering and bioengineering right down the street at UCLA. Um, I think we had a similar theme here in terms of just people being curious. I, I read somewhere that you 
uh, literally sort of smashed into a digital camera to try to take it apart to understand its workings. Talk to us about how that experience applies to the research that you're going to tell us about and how it could uh, you know, dramatically change the world. Sure. So, uh, indeed, uh, it's, it's uh, a lot about the digital revolution that we are having today because um, the components that we enjoy in our cell phones, in our digital cameras, uh, are fantastically advanced. And I'd like to start with a slide that actually highlights that. If you can pull up slide number 22. Uh, I'm sure every one of you uh, must have heard of uh, the Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore was the uh, co-founder of Intel, and he predict, predicted uh, empirically that uh, the density of transistors, the computational elements in our uh, CPUs, in our processors, in our computers, would be doubling every two years, roughly speaking. And uh, that was indeed the case. Um, and uh, on this slide, can you go to the other file that's behind the, uh, to a number 22, slide number 22? Okay. So um, on that slide, uh, I'm showing uh, the, uh, the trend, which is uh, indeed uh, following the Moore's Law, where our density of transistors um, um, has been doubling every two years. But what is surprising is that if you look at the cell phone itself, cell phone cameras, um, you would see that um, the megapixel count of cell phones um, uh, also uh, have been uh, following uh, the Moore's Law. If you look up at the screen, you've got a different image. Digital. Oh, so next slide, please. So here you see exactly the comparison between the Moore's Law and how uh, our computational ability has been increasing versus uh, the camera phones that we have have been getting more and more megapixels, doubling their megapixel equivalent every almost two years. And now, starting from 2002 with 0.2 megapixel cameras, we've reached more than 40 megapixel cameras at the back of our cell phones. That's phenomenal. That wasn't expected. And actually, what it enables for us is amazing. As, as scientists, as researchers who are using these uh, imagers, these silicon chips with millions of small pixels on it to look at small things, like smaller than one millionth of a meter. So this literally opens up the use of a cell phone itself as a microscope, as something that is quite advanced to look at specimen. In the next slide, please, uh, in addition to this hardware that we have on the cell phone, the volume of cell phones are amazing in the sense that we have literally 6.5 billion cell phone subscribers today. If that 6.5 billion was magically 6.5 million, you would literally pay uh, a sl small uh, fortune for your iPhone. And your iPhone would probably not as it be advanced as it, as it is today. So that's the massive scale of the cell phone that has enabled the uh, smartphones to get fantastically smart in terms of their hardware, software, in terms of their computational ability. They're almost like supercomputers of the 90s today. Uh, and in addition to this, more than 70% of these uh, cell phones are actually being used in developing parts of the world. So the, the connectivity and their usage in terms of penetrating even into uh, resource-poor countries is an amazing platform for us as, as scientists, researchers, to tap into to create new tools, new gadgets into the field use, into remote locations, especially for telemedicine applications. In the next slide, um, slide 24, you see some of those uh, examples where um, funded through uh, NIH, NSF, um, and Department of Defense, our lab and others uh, in the nation have been creating new tools that could convert your cell phone into a microscope, into, into something that can look at smaller scale things like viruses, like cells, that are smaller than uh, half a micrometer, like one over two millionth of a meter scale uh, we're talking about. And these are some of those devices that you see on the screen that essentially uh, using cost-effective, compact, lightweight attachments convert the cell phone into microscopes. And there, there is something unique about these microscopes that you see up on the screen, and I'd like to briefly highlight that in, that, in the sense that if you look at your eye or any digital camera or any microscope, the most important part of that microscope is actually the lens. And the lens itself is, you can think of it as a computer, except it's an analog computer. You can replace these lenses with their digital equivalents so that you can use the cell phone itself to create magnification, to create a lensing effect for your specimen. So these uh, gadgets that you see on the screen actually are not using any lenses. And that's why they're very cost effective and compact. 
and lightweight and exactly a fit for the cell phone uh, working exactly uh, in the field settings. In the next slide, I'm, I'm showing you some other examples how you can modify your cell phone if you like to detect, for instance, bacteria like E. coli, uh, to look for allergens uh, like peanuts in your cookies, uh, or to look at diagnostic tests, to read diagnostic tests using an optomechanical attachment to the cell phone. When you insert the diagnostic test, you can capture an image of it, process the image on the cell phone using the cell phone's uh, computational power, and use the display to uh, create a report where the diagnostician or the healthcare worker can enter some more information, upload it to servers where you will be able to monitor as a function of space and time what has been diagnosed and how statistics change. It's a great tool for epidemiology. And you can do blood analysis on your cell phone to count red blood cells, white blood cells, all kinds of things that are opening up through uh, essentially the computation being the key element. So I, I believe this is a great time because this transformation reminds me of the transformation that we had from the personal computer to the internet. It was essentially the, the compactness, cost effectiveness of the PC, personal computer, that enabled us to afford it in masses so that it could essentially be part of our lives. And then the connectivity that is brought by these PCs led to the internet, which is much more powerful and bigger in terms of impact than the sim simple PC was or was thought to be. I believe these kinds of microanalysis devices, diagnostic devices, would also lead to the same kind of a transformation. Because within the next decade or so, we're going to have more than an order of magnitude increase in the use of personal microscopes, personal diagnostic tools, entering the home even for monitoring of chronic conditions. And when you think of this network of devices attached to your cell phones or iPads or other smart uh, uh, electronics, you will form a network which I call as the micro world, micro internet. In the next slide, which is the 26, you can have a, a vision of essentially what the micro uh, internet would look like. It's going to be composed of different kinds of devices, mostly uh, uh, digital, which will capture images of various different specimens, help you diagnose different conditions. And then you're going to be looking at a phenomenally large scale data, a big data that we'll be collecting to find extremely rare patterns, to find things that we couldn't uh, observe before because we didn't have the throughput, we didn't have the large scale data uh, before with our tool set. So it's a great opportunity for essentially scientists, engineers, to design bigger systems that's going to uh, evaluate um, as a function of space and time how things at the micro scale and even nano scale uh, in, in regards to diseases will evolve, have been evolving and will continue to evolve. So that's a, a very timely uh, uh, opportunity for us, I believe. And uh, this will be my uh, remarks. Thank you so much for that. So Jack, you've listened to some of these presentations. I know you've been here with us at the Global Conference for a number of days. You came here from, I think, a Visioneering X Prize meeting. Uh, you know, what, what's your perspective on all of this? And you know, you have a long future ahead of you. Not that the rest of us don't, of course, because we're all going to live forever. But you know, how how do you see yourself fitting into this world? I mean, you know, we've we've heard about a variety of different things. How do you thread the needle? I mean, do you think the the internet is the answer? Do you think meeting people, talking to people, is the answer? Well, being here is pretty pretty cool. I mean, like how many sixteen year olds get come here. I mean, it's insane. Like, wow, holy moly. But um, how I see myself fitting into this equation, kind of, is really that the youth have kind of been seen as a problem. Like, when you think of problem and youth, you're like, oh, oh dear, oh my goodness. But really, youth should be seen as kind of a solution, because we're at this epitome of creativity and knowledge, where we have this, we can come up with these wild ideas, yet we have enough knowledge to breathe life into them. And just really run with these wild ideas. And every great innovation, like a day before that, was like a crazy idea. I mean, I came up with this in biology because I didn't even know what a pancreas was at the beginning of this. <laughs> and for me, like using the internet, that's really what's going to be able to allow us to really come up with these great innovations in the future. Because I just use Google and Wikipedia for this entire project. And what the internet has taught me is that it doesn't matter if you have a fancy degree or what you look like, age or gender. It's just your ideas that count, really. So instead of like taking pictures of your food and posting them on Instagram, you could be like changing the world, for example. <laughs> All of you, put your Instagram away right exactly. now. <laughs> <laughs> Quit
start taking pictures of the centerpiece and start, <laughs> start inventing, right? And what's really, really exciting for me is that in the next few years, 3.5 billion more people will be coming onto the internet. I think we're like doubling the amount of innovators we have. And so that's what's really cool to me. And this open access, especially led by the NIH, will be really exciting to have more of these scientific innovators online. What, what other comments do our panelists have on this issue of uh, sort of equal opportunity out there for good ideas, invention? Um... So it's crowdsourcing, really, <laughs> trying to make sure that you're tapping into the best, brightest brains. And whether that's by uh, a prize mechanism, like uh, the, the tricorder that I gather Jack is contemplating applying to be one of the uh, co co uh, competitors for, or, or whether it is putting out, as we have recently done, uh, grant programs where you can't apply unless you're proposing an idea that is high risk, but it, if it actually worked, it, it would be groundbreaking. That's, that's the threshold you have to meet in order to get into the door and get reviewed. And those are really exciting to look at, things like the Pioneer Awards and the transformative grants uh, that we've started to fund. But let's not forget that this whole enterprise needs resources. And we've been talking very optimistically today about the science, and we should, because it is exhilarating uh, to see the potential. We are, however, in this country at a point where that whole enterprise is under historic stresses in terms of the resources that have been basically uh, frittered away. We have seen over the last 10 years a reduction of about 20% in the purchasing power for biomedical research, and the sequesters took that down again by another major notch a month ago. So we will recover from this, I hope, but at the same time, let's keep in mind that if you really want to empower people to do great things, there have to be resources that come from somewhere. And if it's part of our nation's tradition uh, to be a nation of entrepreneurs and inventors, uh, we should not forget the success story uh, that has been written here that the rest of the world has learned from and that at least temporarily uh, we seem to have forgotten. David, did you feel when you were um, you know, beginning your work that the possibilities were endless and that the funding would come? And do you think that atmosphere has changed a bit? Or for you know, people on the campus of Caltech, are they still feeling that sense of uh, enthusiasm, optimism, and that they'll figure out the funding? Well, it's hard to keep scientists from being optimistic and excited because there are so many opportunities and the technology has gotten so powerful some of the things that Francis was showing us were not even dreams. They, I mean, nobody even conceived of them uh, not many years ago. So uh, around Caltech, around the universities of America, uh, there is a continual excitement. But when I started out in science, it was sort of in the Sputnik era. And we had absolutely no uh, thoughts about not being able to do what we wanted to do. We, uh, we had the country behind us. And we knew we had the country. Even, even as a kid, I knew that the country was behind science and that my choice to go into science meant I was serving my country, I was serving the world, and that the world was going to support that. Uh, I don't think that young people today, I, I'm, you can tell me if you agree or not, uh, but I don't think young people today can feel that because we're in a much more constrained environment. And that cons those constraints uh, lead, I know, young people that I, I come in I contact with to wonder whether there is a path for them to take their incredible skills, their incredible knowledge, uh, and their incredible desires forward um, because of the expense and the lack of obvious support from the country. Do you have comments on that, either of you? No, I mean, I, I would echo that, and I feel like I have conversations every day with um, really, really bright scientists who are thinking about whether to continue on the path or not. And um, they are so excited about the science, which is what's amazing. I mean, the passion that they have, but then they see sort of the realities that might be facing them two or three years down the road. And so, you know, I, I think it is such an imperative right now to really make sure that those minds um, stay in the field, um, in the field broadly, because there are so many opportunities, but I think we just have to make those available and make it um, known that those are valuable resources um, you know, right there and now. 
I, I second all of that. Actually, bold ideas need to be protected. Uh, and especially young investigators are the ones who uh, have a lot of these uh, untested, unconventional ideas, but they don't have the credibility of the senior colleagues that will compete for the same resources or the preliminary results that take, would take it uh, to the next step. That's why I think uh, it's extremely important to keep uh, uh, federal funding in a special category of young investigators, young, uh, young scientists, so that they could offer uh, extremely bold ideas with uh, a special protection from other seniors. And NIH, NSF, and all the other agencies have all these mechanisms in. For instance, NIH has the uh, Director's New Innovator Award, which is specifically a five-year grant uh, I had the um, opportunity to have it, which uh, led to some of these uh, inventions that I've, uh, I've uh, talked today. And I think it was a, a, a great chunk of funding which gave us flexibility and test unconventional ideas, and I think those need to uh, uh, continue with uh, even larger chunks of funding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the constant themes I think that we heard here, just in terms of all of your journeys, your pathways, was getting um, sort of inspired and exposed to science early on. Uh, David, talk, for me, talk to me for a minute about the, y your mom, I think, introduced you to a program at the Jackson Laboratories. How did that influence your, your course ahead? Yeah, we have to go back to the 1950s when all this happened. Um, and there weren't many programs for high school students to do scientific research. Jackson Lab was one of the very first places to have that. And because my mother was involved in the academic world, she was an experimental psychologist, uh, she heard about this program and said, maybe you want to do this. And it changed my life because I discovered uh, then what each of us have discovered at one point or another in our careers. Uh, that is that the frontier of knowledge was just over the hill, that it wasn't miles out there that you didn't have to spend uh, tens of years in study before you got to being able to be a creative scientist. You could do that tomorrow. You can find out what the pancreas is if you don't know what it is um, very easily today. But we could find out in my day even too. There were libraries, there were books, there were things of that sort that you might remember. Uh, <laughs> Library, and what's that? There's your library, what's, what's that? I <laughs> There's agree. room for right. both, right? <laughs> right, right. So uh, I'm, I, that summer, learned that I could do research. That was a revelation, and it changed my life. I just designed the rest of my life around that desire. And it's ex as exciting today, I'm 75, uh, it's as exciting today as it was when I started out. Francis, did you have a similar uh, kind of epiphany as a young person? I did, and for me it was a public school and a very gifted chemistry teacher who, for that first time in my experience, caused me to see how exciting it could be to try to get answers to questions that nobody had figured out yet. The very first day we came to class, he gave each of us a sealed black box, and inside that box was something, and each person had something different, and we were charged with coming up with both real and imaginary experiments that we could do to try to figure out what's inside there, a perfect metaphor for what science is all about. And I left the class that afternoon saying, this is what I want to do. I hope there are teachers like Mr. House out there in lots of public schools inspiring kids in the same way that I was fortunate to be inspired. And I have to say, picking up on what Jack said, when I went to biology class, there was no greater wet blanket on enthusiasm for science than what they were doing in that class, and I fear that may still be. Amen. <laughs> I, I shudder to think I feel like the only thing I gained out of my high school biology was the uh, you know, blue eye, brown eye chart, and uh, I think we can do a little bit better than that. I think, Jack, what your parents, I know in some of the interviews I've read that they've done, it's just the spirit of curiosity, and I think that's also a constant theme that we're hearing here is uh, kind of exploration. So I challenge the audience. We have a few challenges that I want to put down for you. You've heard about the state of funding and the need for, as a uh, country, for us to support our funding for the sciences. So I want you to take a special interest in that cause, whether or not you're a scientist. 
And then I also want you to think about, you know, in your life, this, this area of curiosity. I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that if you are not a noblest or a gene hunter or someone who breaks open cameras and finds fascinating things to do with them or a 16-year-old uh, discoverer or someone who, you know, is going to change the world for how medicine gets delivered, that you're not worthy. Uh, because we all have a role to play here. And I, I think that you've hopefully gotten a little taste of this inspiration. And uh, I know this summer we're going to be doing the Mentos experiment at the beach where you put the Mento into the uh, bottle of uh, soda pop and watch it explode. Because I think it sounds like one of the themes of this conference is that we should all go out and uh, do a little bit of experimenting ourselves. So please join me in thanking this incredible group of panelists. And you're, you, you have a little bit more opportunity. I, uh, I know that there's more panels to come, and there's a fascinating lunch plenary uh, that Dr. Collins and Dr. Frieden from the Centers for Disease Control will be speaking on. So uh, please go out and explore.